everyone and welcome to the start of a reading vlog. In an effort to clear my TBR shelf, I am going to start reading books from that shelf. And today's lucky pick is Phantom Limbs. Look at my little TBR shelf, it's only got six books on it now. Um, I have two other books in my room so I know that's technically cheating there is really eight on here but look six looks so good <laughs> I'm gonna save the Carrie Firestone books so the true color of forever and the loose ends list for a reading double which is sort of like a readathon that Maddie and I do where we read multiple books by the same author so we've already got a couple of picked out and that would just be amazing so it would tick it off my CBR and make for a great reading double pair Ava Lavender is the one I've had on the shelf for the longest but I think that the one that's really calling out to me today is Dare to Fall by Estelle Maskin Look how pretty this cover is as well with the gold foil. This is a standalone book from the author that wrote the Dimily series. This is slightly more serious and sombre contemporary as I think it's of the likes of Jennifer Niven. All I know is that it's been quite a while since Maddie read it and I don't know what she made of it. I think she got through it quite quickly. Even though it looks like quite a big book from the side, it's only 320 pages. I'm 40 pages through, so 10%, and I really like the voice. And um, This is my first male perspective in quite a while, but I absolutely love the idea of the story. So Otis was in a relationship with Meg three years ago, and then she moved away, and now they're 16, and she's coming back to town, and she like has a whole new life away from Otis. They haven't had any communication since, so he very much wants her to come back and it feels like he's definitely still in love with her and she actually has a boyfriend. Otis is also a swimmer and he's training with a girl called Dara who's a couple years older than he is and she is kind of the ode why this is called Phantom Limbs because she is missing an arm. In the first chapter or maybe it was the second chapter Otis said something that was a little bit too like negatively flavoured about amputees. I wasn't expecting that kind of like oh it's disgusting attitude um so that's disappointing and i hope that improves um because he's obviously sensitive to her in the fact that uh he knows just how to help her when she starts feeling that phantom itch but yeah it was just it's just a very weird thing to say from him love the conceit so far very excited for meg to come back i'm 80 pages through dare to fall now and i think it'll be quite bad if i say that i don't really know what's going on there are so many characters with similar names all of the boys end in en there's Darren, Hayden, no, there's Darren, Holden, and Jaden, and I'm getting all of them confused and what their exact um, relationship to Mackenzie is. So I think there's also a guy called Will. There's a lot of boy characters in this. Mackenzie's struggling because her mother's an alcoholic and she's covering for her at school because she's really embarrassed about it. Holden family, no, the Hunter family, um, is Jaden and his sister Danielle and their parents have recently died in a tragic accident, leaving those two children behind and Mackenzie's feeling a lot of things about that because she was in love with Jaden, but now they've all kind of changed because of this drastic event. So, love Square. They've just gone to some football games, they've gone to some diners, just very American things, <laughs> which is typical for Estelle's books. There's a strong vibe, but there's not a lot of plot happening. I'm creeping up on the halfway point and I've got 200 pages left to go. So more drama has unfolded. It turns out that Otis's younger brother Mason died and he died in Meg's old house and that was the catalyst for her moving away. We also know that Dara lost her arm in a shark attack. I really like the pace of this one. Meg and Otis didn't have their first conversation together until about 100 pages through and it's nice that they get to keep talking about their history together without really knowing what their present is going to be. I don't know if I already mentioned but swimming is the main thing in this. Dara is trying to coach Otis to be an Olympic level swimmer and I love it when books have like a very distinct hobby slash sport and that just consumes the character. I think the atmosphere of swimming and coaching is really good, there's not too much jargon um, but there's enough to know that like it is at quite a serious level and I'm just having a good time with it. Although Otis's characterization, I remember B mentioning there's a lot of male gaze in this of how he looks at Meg and other girls and it's just a bit like Ugh, eye roll. But I really like that Phantom Limbs is being used more metaphorically to talk about loss and grief and how that translates to beings too because Otis lost his brother and Meg, I guess Meg is almost like a phantom limb in the fact that she's coming back but not in the same capacity that she was before. Oh and also something else to mention as well as being a swimmer Otis is also a poet. He gets called Shakespeare at school and there's actually quite a decent sonnet from him in this book so he has a sensitive side as well which I guess is supposed to um, override his boyish immature side. <laughs> 
Tis the next day and I'm still going with Phantom Limbs. I've got about 80 pages left to go. We know more about what happened to Otis's younger brother as Meg reveals more about that night and why Otis's mum doesn't like her and why she's not in contact with Meg's mum anymore. It's also been the anniversary of Dara's accident so she's had some episodes and you realise just how much she relies upon Otis to calm herself down in those situations and it comes at crucial moments in places where he could progress in his swimming career. What I really like is that there's absolutely no hesitation from him in helping her even if it disadvantages him in moving forward. He puts her first and I really like that about their friendship. I would say that the representation of disability is is not great in this. Other characters talk about it the way Dara herself talks about it. She uses the word freaks a lot, which I find uncomfortable. So if you're looking for a positive representation, this is definitely not it. If anything, I think it exists for the drama and it's not very sensitive at all. That's a huge negative of this book. I think no matter how good the rest of the story is, there's something just about that part of the storyline that makes it hard to enjoy. Dara has also been struggling with her sexuality throughout the book and not wanting to admit that she has feelings for her best friend Abby. But I'm so pleased that she managed to catch a break and that's something good going on in her life. Now what's going on is Meg and Otis are on a family holiday in Michigan and Meg's boyfriend got invited along so that stops Otis's plans to win her back and there's definitely a lot of competition between them. I don't think I understand really Otis's feelings towards Meg because throughout the book she just seems like a trophy to be won. Obviously they are friends but there's a lot of just objectification or focus on aesthetics which just seems very surface level and I'm not really that into it. So I'm just gonna power through to the end and then come back with my final thoughts. Let's talk about Dare to Fall by Estelle Mascom. So I finished this book and I have many questions about character decisions. Holden is the one to kill Jaden's parents. It was in an accident, he was in an emotional state when he got into a car and he didn't put it together until after the fact and he's kind of been harbouring this secret for so long and decided now is the time to tell someone. So he confides in Mackenzie as a friend of hers, but then she's burdened with this secret because she's now dating Jaden. So if she doesn't say something, then allegedly it's on her. So Mackenzie's heartbreaking trauma is that her mother had a stillborn child. It's completely broken her mum, who's now become an alcoholic. But I felt like the seriousness and the gravity of that depression over loss was undermined by Jaden visiting the house for the first time as, as Mackenzie's boyfriend, saying something about how the daughter wouldn't have wanted her to be drinking. And then Mackenzie gets all offended that he's even said something because he's not supposed to mention it. No one knows that her mum's an alcoholic. And so he's banished from the house. And then the very next day, the mum comes up and is like, yeah, you know what? That is the reality check I needed actually. And seemingly snaps out of her depression alcoholism. From one comment, from this one guy and we're meant to believe that otherwise she wouldn't even realize what she was doing and she was like why didn't you say anything to her husband and Mackenzie um and they were like we didn't want to upset you I yeah I didn't really know how to feel about that I was like having to suspend my disbelief that just this one conversation would completely like turn her back on I think my main problem with this book is that the testosterone levels are just too high there are too many boys like Will for example who's Mackenzie's best friend could be entirely cut. He's a superfluous character. He didn't add anything, unless maybe there was gonna be a seat because it is a very open ending. Then we have Darren who was Mackenzie's ex-boyfriend. And for some reason, Mackenzie decides to tell Darren what Holden told her about killing Jaden's parents. And I was like, why would you do that? Like you're trying to distance yourself from this boy anyway. You're really offended at the fact that Darren's kind of acting as if you're still together, even though you're definitely, definitely broken up. And it just felt contrived as a way for Darren to have something to hold over Mackenzie, because then Darren lets it slip to Jaden and he's like, oh my gosh, she never said anything. They don't want anything bad to happen to Holden, who then at the very end of the book goes to the police and decides to hand himself in. And I'm thinking, who is this helping? I would have actually preferred to have a conversation, a roundhouse conversation with all of the characters where they said it was an accident because Jaden for all intents and purposes has moved on from his parents death he's not letting it affect him that's his whole aura of they wouldn't want me to be living my life upset I'm going to which is clearly inspiring to Mackenzie but the point is I don't think that Jaden would have wanted that being his attitude and mindset for Holden to turn himself in I think he would have said there have been too many people hurt from this situation already you don't need to throw your whole life away because I think it would have been a more sentimental ending um, and certainly interesting for Jaden's character if he had said 
I forgive you. So in the end, I'd probably give this like a 2.5 stars, right in the middle. So I'm now finished with Phantom Limbs and it had a much more open ending than I expected. There's actually a huge time jump between the last chapter and the penultimate one. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much time has passed, but something tragic happens with Dara, so Otis has to flee their holiday in Michigan and leave Meg behind. Meg goes back to California. Meg had broken up with her boyfriend and she and Otis were getting closer. They have that cathartic moment where Meg talks in detail about her therapy and what happened that night with Mason. All of the things she was scared to tell Otis in case he didn't still like her anymore. And you realise that it has deeply affected her, that she obviously needs to heal from, and Otis needs a better way of talking through his feelings. And Meg seems to be moving through the stages of her therapy that means that she can reach out to Otis and want them to be together romantically, and the very final page is Otis deciding whether or not that's something that he wants. I was really surprised that this book actually wants to give time for the characters to be in a safer and healthier space, because going into this book I did expect it to just be that they ended up together, that those things were set aside. It's added a little bit more depth to the story, a bit more credibility to think that they didn't want to rush into things or knew that it would be stupid to, which might go some way to cancelling out some of the superficial stuff the actual like narrative time of the book covered. With this and We Are Okay, grief books seem to be the theme, so I picked It's Kind of a Funny Story by Ned Vizzini as my next read to dive a little bit deeper into the mental health aspects. It is about a suicidal teenager who then gets placed in a facility and about all of the people that he meets there. I remember seeing the movie quite a few years ago with Emma Roberts and I'm not entirely sure who the male lead is, white boy of the month probably, but it's been long enough that I don't really know the story, I just I'm hoping that it has kind of me and Earl and the dying girl vibes and it's very much based on the author's personal experience although sadly he has died so I think that's just gonna bring some gravity to reading it. I've just been slipping a little bit deeper and deeper into potential sadness so Phantom Limb's definitely the least sad then we are okay and maybe this one will be the most sad. Let's dive in shall we? <laughs> New day, new progress, I'm 185 pages through. Craig has just been admitted to the mental facility and it was kind of hard to get through, honestly. I think he handled everything very rationally, but to be in somebody's head when they're feeling that vulnerable and suicidal, it's hard because I definitely felt things for sure, like a very accurate and knowing that it's something that the author has gone through as well. Not a pleasant read, but you know, things aren't always meant to make you feel comfortable. So I'm very much looking forward to how he interacts with everyone else. Rather than going to the teen section, he is being housed with the adults because of some renovations. In the B has suggested that we do some reading sprints and take note of how many pages we managed to read in each segment. So we'll do three 10 minutes and then report back on our progress. And it turns out that we can both read a maximum of 40 pages in that time. I now have 60 pages left to go. How are you doing, B? I've got 90 pages left to go. Okay, so we're only a couple of sprints out of finishing these books, which is really great. Craig is now talking to one of the girls his age that's also in the unit called Noelle, and they're in love now. It's come very out of the blue, but I really liked the friendships that he's formed with the people there, and his therapist is saying that it's not a good idea to be so connected with them because healing should be something that you do by yourself, and you can't rely on people because they change and so do relationships. But I think community is exactly what these people need to feel understood, so that's actually quite sweet. And I like seeing the slow improvement for them all. And I'm done with It's Kind of a Funny Story. Close to the beginning of the book, Craig talks about how he was obsessed with drawing maps because it gave some kind of order to his brain. And then during his therapy, he uses that as a way to heal and put his mind on different things, draw things for other people too, and just realise that that's where his passion lies rather than just school and work. I think maybe I was a little bit hasty to say that he and Noelle were in love. I think they were just both interested in each other and want to pursue a relationship outside of the ward, so it wasn't as heavy-handed as I might have made it sound, and I thought in the end it was quite a hopeful story. So for a book about a depressed kid, I didn't find it really depressing to read, and it'll happily join the little niche on our shelves of books about inpatients. And when I mean niche, I mean quite the little collection, <laughs> all about kids that go to improve their mental health throughout the story. So potentially look out for a recommendation video on these books, because they're all really great reads. <laughs> So my first read of the day is going to be Far From The Tree by Robin Benway and I've read her first book Emmy and Oliver and absolutely loved it. It was a five star read from me so I'm expecting good things from this one. It's told from three perspectives and they're all siblings who've lost contact through the adoption system. I've read the first chapter about Grace who was pregnant and then gave her baby up for adoption at the age of 16 and that triggered her to want to know about her biological mother and then she finds out that she has a sister and a brother and now she's trying to get in contact with them. The amount of stuff that you had to know in this first chapter was handled really well and I'm so intrigued about how she'll 
you'll get to know the other siblings and the found family vibes that this will have, even though they're actually family. Also with three perspectives, I am a little bit nervous as always that I'll like one of them more than the other and whether they'll sound similar, at least to the two girls. So I'll keep you updated on my thoughts. I've decided that my first book of the day shall be Truly Wildly Deeply by Jenny McAlden. This is a book still from my Maddie TBR shelf. And this is the story of a girl with cerebral palsy who wants to fall in love when she goes to college. I'm now 100 pages through and I'm actually really, really enjoying this. I think the style is so light and bubbly. It's very reminiscent of Geek Girl, which I didn't realise is exactly what I wanted to read right now. She's fully settled in at college and her journey to making friends was very quick and easy and simple, which is nice because now she's just living college life, going to parties, having friends come over to her house. Like it feels right on the edge of being maybe a tad too young for 17, but also kind of working, believably. The most interesting thing that's happened is she's been paired with a boy called Fabian in her English class to work on a project on Wuthering Heights. And because English is his second language, he said some insensitive things to her about her disability, but he's shown growth and learning, but he's also easily influenced by the characters of Wuthering Heights. So because they're working together in a group and they're reading this crazy love story, he believes that he's in love with Annie. So he asks her out and she rejects him. And I really never thought I'd be that excited to read about a rejection, but it was really cool. I don't think I've ever seen anyone shoot anyone down in a book before. So I kind of hope that he takes that as the be all and end all. She doesn't like your man, move on. But I also highly doubt that will be the case. It's the you're my girlfriend now, never speak to another person part that I'm not into. Say it louder. Yeah, I'm just gonna stand up while I read for a bit, otherwise I'll be sat down 12 hours. I've read just over 100 pages now, met all the siblings, and I love them. I love their interactions, I love how different they are, but how they're already bonding. Grace and Maya seem a lot closer, even though they're polar opposites, and Joaquin is a bit more hesitant to interact with them because he's just nervous that they won't like him. They've all got different backgrounds in terms of their process of being adopted. Grace was adopted and she was an only child, and Maya has a biological sister with her parents that are arguing a lot, so that's a direct contrast to Grace's family who are just the cutest thing ever. And then Joaquin has just been in the foster system for his entire life and his parents now want to adopt him, which I think is really sweet, but he's got a complex about not necessarily deserving that. Joaquin is also half Mexican and I think there's a really interesting like race thread throughout this and some points being made about why the girls who are white got adopted and how it was easier for them um, whereas he's just been in the foster system. Because of Grace's background having just given up her baby for adoption she really wants to find their birth mother whereas the others just don't want to do that. They're like she gave us up and they don't have that same sympathy that Grace does because she's been in that position. Obviously for the book to continue I assume that they do try and track down the mother and that they all get in on that eventually and it's just been really sweet so far like the way the character characters are introduced and how much information you get about them. It's just such good writing. Despite having rejected Fab, he decides his tactic is going to be just keep asking her until she's worn down. Which works, unfortunately. And so they go on a little date and she realises maybe she does like him more than she thought. And so they're getting to know each other more, still with, you know, just regular party teenage shenanigans happening in the background. And then she goes to his house to meet his family and he finds out that she kissed another boy, Jim, kind of drunkenly at one party. And although both Annie and Jim, the other boy in this kiss, said that it meant nothing to them, Fab is uncomfortable with the idea of her having kissed anyone else, which is... no yikes. So they're not really speaking and now she just wants him back, like, absence makes the heart grow fonder I guess what you can't have she wants even more so I think she's now on a mission to try and get him back and I've only got like 60 or so pages left to go so I wonder whether or not that will happen. I'm now over 200 pages through and I really like how each character's story arc isn't following the same pattern like when something's good for Grace then it's bad for the other two it just makes for a really interesting reading experience that they're all going through different emotional states. The drama is Grace punched someone at school for bullying her essentially about being young and pregnant um, and giving up her baby so now she has to be homeschooled and that was like an out of character thing for her because throughout the whole book she's been characterized as this really weak passive kind of kitten person so for her to step out of her shell like that and especially for family um, it's really powerful. Maya's parents are divorcing and her mum's drinking problem is getting much stronger so much so that her other sister Lauren is nervous about it and she's told Grace and Joaquin too. She's also broken up with her girlfriend which kind of came out of nowhere but the breakup scene was really good it went on for a couple of pages and I thought like the emotion was well handled throughout. Joaquin is also having some problems with dating because he broke up with his girlfriend before the narrative arc of this story and now she approached him about it and said that he was just scared. Lots and lots of drama and the only lightness has been Grace meeting this new guy called Rafe who works at a kitchen supply shop. Um, their banter was really sweet when they went on their frozen yogurt date and I'm very happy for her. 
I want them to be together. So the next 150 pages will be some problem solving, I think. <laughs> it's well in need and they will need to come together and support each other through their hard times. This is just a five star read, like from the first chapter I knew that I would really vibe with this writing style. And I love all the characters. No one's really boring me or standing out above the others, they're all just equally well imagined. Can't wait to keep going! Although their birth mum hasn't come up again yet, and I think we're maybe too far through the story now for it to be a significant chunk, so I don't want that to feel rushed if that is how things happen in the rest of the book. So I just finished and I have to admit it was delightful. It has a really sweet ending in that they go to Hayworth and try and live out some Wuthering Heights dreams, running around in fields, and decide that being together is going to be a challenge for both of them as it's their first relationship, but they're going to try together. I think there were a lot of characters in this series, but maybe that's just Jenny McLaurin's style, and we kind of lost them along the way. All of the people that she made friends with at the beginning of her college life um, faded into the background which was a bit of a shame as I would have preferred. I would have preferred more equal weighing of development between her new friendship with Hillary and her new relationship with Fab, but this book is just under 300 pages so you can only do so much. I loved that although this was a story about a girl with cerebral palsy, it wasn't about her having cerebral palsy, so I think this is more what people are looking for when they just want representation that isn't just all about disability. I would definitely describe this as a feel-good book and I'm happy to have read it. Even though I really don't like Wuthering Heights and I've read too many Wuthering Heights themed books this year. It means I now get to pick a next book and I'm going with Everything Beautiful Is Not Ruined by Danielle Young Ullman. This is a story that I bought at Yelg but Maddie read first. I'm pretty sure it's about some sort of recovery camp. I'm finished with Far From The Tree and it was the sweetest read ever. I loved how everybody got their happy ending, the epilogue was the most satisfying thing. It's not often that you get to read books where family and siblings are at the centre of it because so often it's relationships and other social issues happening to the characters. It was so refreshing and lovely to see See that kind of dynamic between characters, to witness their bond strengthening as they went through things together. I loved any moment between the three of them. So they do go and try and find their birth mother, and it's not exactly what they're expecting, but it does give them all some closure on knowing that they were loved and wanted. And it was just great. I feel like a little choked up just thinking about how lovely it was. So I'm going to give this five stars, and this has kind of come out of nowhere for me because I didn't think that B was that enamoured by it when she read it, like enough to say that she liked it, but it definitely wasn't a standout read. So I think that's why I was putting off reading it for so long, but I'm really really happy to. This is now one of my favourite stories and I'll definitely have to look out for whatever Robin Benway does next because she's now written two winners. Because me and B managed to read so much this week we've split the video into two parts so stay tuned for our next video where we'll show you what we read for the rest of the week. Thanks for watching!